Welcome to the 3030 Health Podcast. The following discussion is for education and entertainment. It is not intended to diagnose or treat disease. Please do not apply any of this information without first discussing it with your doctor. Here is your host, Dr. Ruiz. Hello, everyone. Super excited about today's show. My guests today are Dr. Sandra Kahn and Professor Paul Ehrlich. Dr. Kahn is a graduate from the University of Mexico and the University of the Pacific in San Francisco, California. She has 25 years of clinical experience in orthodontics and has done graduate work in the area of physical anthropology at the University of California in Berkeley and recently retired from traditional orthodontics to focus on airway-centric orthodontics and pediatric obstructive sleep apnea prevention using forwardontics. Her approach is to promote harmony of the jaws, not just straining the teeth. Paul Ehrlich is being professor of population studies emeritus and president of the Center for Conservation Biology at Stanford University, as well as adjunct professor at University of Technology, Sydney. Professor Ehrlich is author and co-author of more than 1,000 scientific papers and articles and over 40 books. He is the author of the seminal book, Population Bomb, and his awards and honors list is so long, I'll just recommend you Google him. This was really an amazing interview, and I hope you learned as much as I did. Also, if you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and visit my website, 3030strong.com. And now the show. Hello, everyone. Super excited to have Paul and Sandra here uh, in the show in uh Kachun, kachun, ra, ra. So before we begin, you know, I like to start my podcast with a, a little introduction. So if you guys want to start uh, introducing yourself, what is your hero story? This is a fantastic story. We've done several interviews and we've never really gotten that question. And I like it because it really, really shows or, or it represents why I got into this, uh, this journey. And it's because my son has had uh, issues. He had issues since he was very young. He was snoring. And I was, uh, I'm an orthodontist, and I knew that that wasn't good. And I took him around to every practitioner and every person that I knew could help. And there were no answers. So it took me, it was a struggle. It took me almost 10 years to find out what the correct thing I should have done after I did so many mistakes. So I, I decided to write this book in order to help other parents uh, navigate their way. So the, the story for me is very, very personal. And then that's part of why I started this, this work. But then I, I, got, um, I got involved with Paul. And, you know, he's, uh, he's an evolutionary bio biologist. And, uh, you know, he can tell you about how he got interested in such a different topic from what he does. Well, uh, interestingly, uh, I am very much concerned, obviously, with various aspects of the environment. And my closest colleague working with me on the mass extinction event we're now suffering is Gerardo Ceballos from UNAM. And that's where the kachun kachun ra ra comes from. My dad, uh, he attended UNAM in uh, in in Mexico City, and uh, that's how my brother was born in Mexico City. So uh, for anyone that was confused by my battle cry, that's where it comes from. Well, Sandra was born in Mexico City, I yes, guess. Yes. yes. Her her I mean, husband was Spanish. raised in Mexico, although he was born in the U.S. And they're they're both U.S. citizens and live in the Bay Area. But my friend Gerardo uh, got involved with Sandra and David uh, on a an NGO looking to try and preserve Mexican biodiversity and particularly the jaguars, a rainforest a reef. And Sandra and David run an eco resort near Zihuatanejo, a wonderful place called Playa Viva. And Gerardo, being friends with them and friends with us because we become very close, uh, him and his wife, Pupa. And so uh, he introduced us to David and Sandra about 15 years ago. And we became fast friends because of our major interests in environmental issues. And then we discovered we had a common interest in something which I think is unknown in Mexico called the Dino, Dino, Tinto. Yeah. Dino, Tinto. <laughs> Dino. And so we often have dinners together and Sandra would tell me about this problem, which became obvious to me that it's a huge environmental problem. The biggest environmental change human beings have made on the planet is first to settle down and practice agriculture 
uh, and then uh, to go on to industrialization. And the results of that are the problems we're facing. And that's one of the things we want to talk about. That is how we got into this mess and how we're going to cure it. And the thing that interests me most, I think, is that with the other hideous environmental problems we face, pollution, toxification in general, loss of biodiversity, climate disruption, overpopulation, overconsumption, inequality, all are critical issues. This is one where you can actually protect yourself and your kids to a degree from it. If you're worried about climate change, what can you do to make sure that your five-year-old doesn't suffer from climate change? Not a lot. But with this problem, if you recognize it in your four or five-year-old or your two-year-old, then you can do something about it. So that's basically our stories. I think Paul kind of like uh, skirted away from talking about himself. He's being modest. How did you become or, or what interested you about and in, in, uh, made you become an evolutionary scientist? Well, when I was a kid, my mother taught me a lot about nature and I became interested in butterflies and I started a butterfly collection. And the difference is the variation you got from the same population of butterflies and so on interested me. So I started when I was in high school buying books on evolution and I eventually went and that was I trained to become a professional geneticist and evolutionary biologist. So that was one natural direction. And the other one was that I lived in a hideous place called New Jersey, you may have heard of it, <laughs> and the cancer center of the country. Everything and, is legal in New Jersey. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, or in Vegas. But anyway, <laughs> I discovered that I couldn't bring in food plants to raise my butterflies on because they were doing so much spraying of DDT that basically the whole countryside was poisoned. And that got me interested in those issues. And I became professionally involved. I worked in a genetics laboratory on DDT resistance, the evolution of DDT resistance in the 50s. And then I, they hired me at Stanford to, among other things, teach evolution. And I gave a 10-week course in which I talked nine weeks about where human beings had come from, and the last week was where we were going. And I haven't been pleased with the direction we're going, and we don't know yet whether we were smart to practice agriculture. You remember, settling down to practice agriculture allowed us to invent poverty. It allowed us to industrialize and invent wonderful things like nuclear weapons. So today, it'll come as a surprise to you, I'm sure, uh, we've gotten to the point where we have uh, a totally narcissistic, racist moron uh, with the capability of blowing up the entire world. So, <laughs> is it a smart move? Tell me. You know, I'm really interested in, in studying mismatches. And when I got the email talking about the orthodontics uh, mismatch and how the industrialized uh, complex has created bad jaws that lead to snoring, you know, it kind of like jogged my memory about reading about Weston A. Price and his uh, his studies uh, on on how the industrialized people, you know, develop tooth decay and then uh, the traditional populations didn't. What is the mismatch that you guys are studying? The, the mismatch really comes from, you know, you, you, you already know this stuff. You just said it. But is it genetic? Is, are we having crooked teeth because... The, it's a, just a genetic problem. It's a mix between somebody that has big teeth and somebody that has smaller jaws. They get together, have a child, and that's why the child has crooked teeth. Or is it the environmental? Is it something that we've done either you know during you know, pregnancy or after the baby was born or the first years or throughout our life? So our book is, is um, it's called Jaws, the story of a hidden epidemic. And it's hidden because we have been looking at this problem wrong. We have been looking at it as, you know, it's genetic. You just have, you know, a little problem with your teeth. Let's take one here, move these, line them up, make them pretty, and you're, you're good to go. And we know, for one thing, we know that this doesn't work because everybody's teeth get crooked again. And, you know, they have to either wear retainer for the rest of their life. And also, the faces don't look any better after they've had the teeth straightened. And when we pointed that out, people started looking at people that have braces, and they realized that they were looking, their whole face was looking better before they had the, the treatment. So I don't know exactly what you mean by mismatch, but basically we are looking at what's causing the problem, and 
the more we look at it, the more env environmental it is. We're not chewing enough. We are not breastfeeding long enough. We're not exercising the jaws. And the kids, everywhere you go, you see children uh, are hanging their mouth open. They're either, they either have allergies or they're hanging their mouth open or they're you know, just breathing through their mouth because they're, they're, they have stopped nose. We've moved indoors. So we've changed our environment all the way from when we, we, um, we developed agriculture, we're in a hunting, hunting gathering and we are able to, to eat different foods and process our foods more. So we are not putting the effort that our jaws need to be big enough to house all the teeth and for us to be healthy because the jaws being little or the teeth being crowded is not just an aesthetic problem. It's, it actually has uh, health connotations. It sounds like you, you know this stuff. For my listeners, in case they're not uh, familiar with the concept of a mismatch, it's the idea that we are not devolving but that the inputs that we're receiving from the environment are mismatched and our body is adapting to those inputs. Like, for example, uh, you know, monkeys that live in, lab, in labs, they tend to lose their hair and they, they, they tend to have higher levels of stress. So the mismatch being that they are in the wrong environment. And uh, we can medicate them. We can tie their their legs and their and their uh, uh, hands so they so they don't uh, pull their hair. And that's just removing the symptom of of losing their hair. But the underlying cause is that they are not in the jungle. So the mismatch being is that they are not adapted to live in a lab. They are adapted to live in the jungle. Well, I know that's exactly what we normally say is that we we've brought hunter-gatherer genes for your face and jaw into a non-hunting gathering environment. And uh, that's, the, that's a gigantic mismatch. People have recognized this in other ways. Uh, there is a huge literature, of course, on what on the nutritional value of food. You know, should you have a, a uh, hunter-gatherer diet, how much meat is safe to eat, how much, what sugar do you all this? But there's nothing on chewing. The whole the whole nutritional industry has totally missed a major factor uh, in the health of human beings with all the focus, which is important. I mean, a good example, actually, tell them about breastfeeding. Well, when you breastfeed, you're exercising your muscles in your face because the, the milk doesn't just drop into your mouth. You have to work for it. Some of the babies actually sweat when they're trying to get the milk out. And a baby that's bottle fed, it's basically just receiving passive milk. We're, you know, uh, uh, waterboarding this baby because we just, you know, let them, you know, receive. And they're actually, uh, they have to negotiate this very foreign uh, physiology that they have to deal with. As opposed to a baby that's breastfeeding and then it's going into hard food, they're negotiating how to deal with, you know, harder food, how to use their muscles. And we know, I, I know that being a middle-aged woman, I'm, I've been told by my doctor to do some weights so that my bones stay healthy. And we lose calcium when we don't have those, those pressures. And this, is, this goes out throughout our life. The babies that are breastfeeding and the young kids that are chewing hard food and they're keeping their mouth closed, they are getting their bones the right biology, the right uh, physiology so that they can develop and have the expression of the, the genetic expression of the size that they need to house the, the teeth that they have genetically. It is so interesting. So the concept of we are not in a maladaptive space, as in our molars are not maladapted. It, you know, the adaptations are correct. Our body is doing what it can with the inputs that we're receiving. For example, when breastfeeding or when eating, that you know you're working on those masters, you know you're you're you know those chipmunk cheeks that end up when you look at all the studies about jaw symmetry. That square jaw ends up being more appealing than that moon face witchy type of jaw. Are you guys familiar with the work of Mike Mew? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the book is dedicated to Mike and his father. 
he did an excellent uh, lecture at the, at the Ancestral Health Symposium back in 2013, 2014 on the on the very topic. Uh, and he is going to be presenting at the Ancestral Health, Health Symposium this year in Bozeman, uh, Montana. I'll be presenting on, on a, a different type of adaptation of botanicals against bacteria and how the plants are usually exposed to pathogens too, and they have to create adaptations to fight those pathogens and how we as humans can take those those adaptations and use them as medicine. So uh, it's, a, it, you know, if, for anyone listening, if you're interested in evolutionary biology, this is the conference to go to because it's about mismatches. You're getting me where I live. <laughs> you may have heard that plants develop chemical defenses because they can't run away. And it's called co-evolution of plants and herbivores. That is, the plants develop the poisons and the herbivores try and find ways to detoxify them so they can still eat the plants. Have you ever heard of co-evolution? Totally, totally. Do you know the, who wrote the original paper on co-evolution? It was it, was it Dr. Paul Elric? And Dr. Peter Raven in 1960 or something like that, way the hell back. No, it was more, yeah, something like that anyway. So you don't have to persuade me on that. <laughs> so no, totally. I, you know, and, and it's so fascinating because what's the saying? Nothing makes sense unless we look at it under the lens of evolution. And if we continue patching this, this symptoms, like for example, the narrow jaw by putting wires and stretching it, uh, we are never going to get to the root cause of what's the problem. So let's talk about, you know, the different inputs that you need in order to have expression of the right, correct genes. So what are some things that our listeners can start checking off in order to uh, to make sure that, that their kid's jaw is not narrow, moon-like, but more like a square jaw? Well, the first thing they have to do is buy our book. <laughs> yes. That'll fix your jaw instantly. No, but I, I, we were talking about this and on page 90. I know this is radio, but on page 90 of our book, we have the photographs. This, this book is very heavily photographed because, as you know, this is something that you need to see to understand. And we have the photographs of two uh, sisters that are very, very similar genetically. But one of them, they're both instructed to close their mouth and, and, and chew hard food. And one of them is successful and the other one is not. And then you have the picture a few years later of how their faces are completely different. One has that square jaw and the other one has a very long face that's almost painful for her to try to close her mouth because she's, she's basically melted down. Her whole you know, facial structure has come down. Um, Dr. Mew came up with a term called craniofacial dystrophy, which is actually you know, a, a term that we need to start using because you can see all these kids and adults that are, have been, you know, hit by this, this condition. So the, the things that parents can do is obviously every case is different, but you have to really go and, and see how far you've moved away from the right growth. And if you've moved away just a, a couple of years, it's very easy. You can go back to habits and, and correct those habits in a better diet and Definitely staying away from, from processed, highly processed foods and soft foods and just going back to our hunter-gathering ways in, in, uh, as far as chewing. And also making sure that we, we don't have allergies. We're not stopped in. Try to do more things out, outdoors because there's more, more allergens inside. So, you know, teaching our kids to keep their mouth closed. And we have another, uh, uh, well, I have another book that I wrote with a different doctor about the oral posture, the good oral posture. So you can have exercises. And, you know, the, one of the things, the areas that fascinate me is brain plasticity. I, I just and, put my tongue to the roof of my palate as you said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would be hard because you don't have the architecture. So your tongue doesn't fit. So you have to get, you know, everything has to work together. But brain plasticity is great because you can do simple exercises and then you can rewire your brain so that that becomes a common place for you. And if you're very young, the exercises are enough. If you're older, um, I don't really uh, deal with adult problems, but I know Dr. Michael Mew does a lot of that. So if you, if you develop the architecture by using some kind of device, then you can rewire your brain to regain that position, which is uh, the one that's going to help you develop better and, and also stay healthier. Okay, so let's rewind a little bit. 
so you mean to tell me that pureed foods and chicken nuggets and uh, mashed potatoes are not good for our... We mean, we mean to tell you exactly that. <laughs> Next time you're in a restaurant, ask for a really tough steak and then take a sharp knife, grab it in your teeth and then pull and cut the knife, cut it off with a knife and chew it for 15 minutes. That's the, uh, the way to go. But actually, we're making enemies, not just of some orthodontists. By the way, not all. We've been invited next year already to a conference on uh, the joint pain in the TMJ. Joint. Yeah, TMJ. Uh, but we are recommending uh, and actually doing some research into uh, getting gums, chewing gums, and reintroducing gums to kids. I mean, after all, one of the big nasty environmental changes we've been talking about is the baby food industry. You know, they give you soup and pap. Uh, when uh, kids really ought to be chewing before they have teeth. And they should be gumming tougher foods and trying to eat fruits and so on uh, that way. So uh, there's a lot that can be done, but we also need social change. In other words, it's hard to find practitioners that take a holistic view, that realize that ENT people should be talking to orthodontists and regular dentists and nutritionists and so on, because it's all one big complex. And it's a complex we've changed so dramatically in the last 10,000 years, which is a blink of the eye in evolutionary terms. That's why we've still got Stone Age genes uh, in a non-Stone Age environment. You know, that that's super interesting. So when I started doing this paleo thing, you know, I've been doing it since like around 2008. I removed all of my processed foods, you know, and I did start chewing a little bit more. Uh, my girlfriend has suffered with like like bruxism, which is like grinding of her teeth. And then we saw that Mike Mew uh, presentation. I had been not chewing gum for like three or four years. And then I, I actually went and bought my first pack of gum. A couple of things that I've noticed. Notice that, you know, if you chew gum, you can concentrate better. I don't know if that. No, that's there's research on that. Okay. Just there's scientific re research on concentration and chewing gum. And then she kind of fixed, and this is all her. I've been in, in the evolutionary theory kind of realm for a while, and she's the one that brought, you know, like, you need to watch this. <laughs> she kind of fixed her jaw. She doesn't have a, as much pain anymore. And, and now we have gum all the time. What types of gum would you recommend for my listeners? You know, uh, is, there, is there a special kind that you like, or what type of sweeteners would be the best ones? Well, I, I don't, uh, don't want to get into the chemical composition of foods because that's been you know there's so many so much information on that and you can you can drive yourself mad looking at oh this is going to kill you and this is going to kill you and meanwhile your jaw is going to be melting <laughs> and, you know, by far the best gum in the planet is mastica from, from greece it's it's a resin it's direct from the tree it has zero processing i mean there's other other chewable things that that um that you can get but mastica you can order online amazon has it and it's practically you know just a resin it's a very hard gum so it makes you very tired when you chew it the it's very expensive but the interesting thing is you can rechew it forever you can <laughs> do it for a while and then when you're Stick done it on the bottom of your chair <laughs> and then when you want it again you you know i actually give some of my patients a little box and i said you know here's your gum and you chew this for a month and you, you retreat it, and then for five minutes, you chew on both sides, you give them the protocol exercises, and it makes a huge difference. Uh, I was living in Spain for two years, and in Spain, there's been a lot of research done over 100 years. There's a doctor called Planas that he really has been doing this stuff for, you know, he's, he's already dead, obviously, but he has a lot of followers. And when I went to the practices that follow his concepts, He's, he basically says he has all Cro-Magnons in the practice because they're, the kids that get to his practice are all very wide. The fists are very wide, very strong. And what they do is they, they give gum to the kids when they're very young, two, three, four years old. They tell them to you know, chew very hard. They make sure that they have no allergies or adenoids or whatever problem they have. They teach the parents how to um, keep their teeth closed. And they also do a lot of grinding of the baby teeth. I don't know if this is too technical, but one of the reasons kids hang their mouth is allergies is one, but another one is when they have a cavity and they have a painful tooth, then they don't want to keep their teeth together. 
And so they make sure that there's no pain and they tell them, okay, if you have pain and you were only chewing on one side, now you have to compensate and chew on the other side. And they do the grinding because we're supposed to be grinding our teeth. That we should have a lot more wear than we have. So they actually wear, do some grinding on their teeth to, to show the wear that we should have. So the teeth fit better and the two jaws end up growing more horizontally with more space for the tongue. And, and these kids look fantastic. And it's up to the research to, to look at their airway and see if they're healthier. But the, as far as attractiveness, they, they look fantastic. Have you guys done any studies or do you guys talk about like the micronutrients needed in order for healthy jaw development? Like I said, I'm not going to get into the micronutrients of the nutritional part. I mean, I have my, my research, personal research and my opinions. I just want to do look at what hasn't been looked at. And that's what we call the book Hidden Epidemic, because nobody's looking at the consistency of the food at how much work you're putting and how many times you're chewing and how you're sitting when you're chewing and you know what uh, what are you doing when you're talking and how you're breathing when you're talking and when you're sleeping are you keeping your teeth together where is your tongue all these things have to do with the with the lifestyle that we that we teach our children from what foods we put in front of them if we give them a uh, you know we give a, a six months old you know a full apple or a piece of celery or if we actually mush the, the food and, and overcook it. So all these choices is what I'm looking at, more than really the, the composition. I do feel that if you give kids, like you're into the paleo stuff, if you give them unprocessed things, you will definitely be giving them better nutrients. Yeah, we, and if, you, if the soil that where they're grown has you know, healthy microorganisms and, and, and not minerals, we're doing the research, we couldn't even find out uh, a historical trend in the softness of food. We had to sort of put it together from figuring when they went to pastries, when the sugar went, uh, when they first invented the meat grinder and so on, but they paid no attention to this. But I'm really interested in the micronutrient stuff because, as a matter of fact, I just published a paper yesterday with a colleague on the world food problem, and people don't understand that billions of people are micronutrient malnourished. And part of that, it ties right in with the processing uh, that, that makes non-chewable as well. One of the things, I don't know if you've run into it, but um, it turns out as you add CO2 to the atmosphere, besides screwing up the weather, you also reduce the nutrient quality of basic crops because they get all the carbon they need. And so they don't pick up as much of the other things. And there's a, just a beginning literature you're right to be concerned about the micronutrients. We're right not to get in the middle of that battle. Uh, because among other things, we don't want to appear to be, you know, you see all these websites that say the non-sugar diet, the this diet, the that diet, and so on. This goes across all the diets. And uh, and besides, who's got time to argue with those people? It, totally. And, you know, and, and, and that's, that's such a great point. You know, instead of fighting, you know, uh, amongst ourselves about – Oh, how much uh, omega-3 fatty acids do you need or what, well, how many grams of carbs should you eat a day? We, we should be fighting against the, the, the big problem, which is big pharma and big, big pharmacy and all of these uh, giants that are probably really happy we're fighting amongst ourselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So are you describing the CO2 problem as like a type of diabetes in the plant where they have so much CO2 that they, that they kind of like, okay, I can survive in this. This is easy access. You know, let's not take iron from the soil. Let's not take magnesium from the soil and just gross. Not an area of my expertise, but the, the data show if you raise plants in a high CO2 atmosphere, they easily take care of their uh, need for energy and so on. And they do not end up taking up as much of the nutrients, the other nutrients, which they may not need so much for. In other words, they, you know, very, very small amounts, as you know, and the micronutrients do their job. Doubling the micronutrients doesn't necessarily uh, change. As you know, the other side of that coin is a lot of toxins. Uh, now we understand our hormone mimics and actually do more damage to you in tiny quantities. Than, uh, than in big quantities. The old rules that more is always better, that uh, dose makes the poison. You know, you've probably been told a thousand times in school, 
that common salt is a poison. If you eat a pound of common salt, you're going to die. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there are lots of things where if you eat a pound, you'll be all right. But if you eat a tiny little bit, you're going to be in trouble. Anyway, uh, complex areas, people really have to pay attention. The big problem is that we don't look enough at prevention at the big picture and so on. We're much too hooked on the cures. And big pharma, well, I, I, I'll give you my own personal prejudice. I hate the ads for drugs on TV. Among other things, who the hell knows the answer? You get many of them say, tell your doctor if you live in an area where certain fungal diseases are coming. <laughs> Half the doctors wouldn't know that you're talking about. You're, you're living in one. And they give you the side effects like your gonads drop off and then you die. So what <laughs> And that's what's funny, you know, because like every time I hear uh, that commercial, I, you know, as a practicing physician, I know that I live in an area that it's that has a lot of coccidomycosis, which is valley fever. And I and my, my ears go, Arr? you know, I, I it, yeah, I, I do, you know, but as a, like as a consumer, do you really know if you live in an area that has fungal infections? That's nice. Yes, or athlete's foot. <laughs> yeah, athlete's foot and, and, and my house. My house is a ton of cheese and kombucha, so that's an area of high uh, mold. Um, now, what would you tell a parent that are worried about their kids choking? Because now, now I can only imagine the cutest thing, which is a baby with a rib bone. Well, that, that's a, a difficult matter because we have to change the common practices. And I have a... a really adorable video of a, of a baby that's um, about 10 months old and it's trying to negotiate a piece of food <laughs> and obviously the it's scary for the for the mother when the, the food goes the wrong way but the baby the mom is is calm and tells the baby to you know be careful and to chew the food and to slow down and she's right there in case she needs to to dislodge the food and she's you know knowledgeable and she knows how to do it but it doesn't really happen that often. The babies that choke are the ones that uh, they have been fed very liquid diets, and then they they pass that stage of development, and they cannot negotiate the the, the bigger foods. So you're not going to give a baby um, a full grape, but a baby can take half a grape, you know, a very young baby, and just using the gums kind of squeeze it and, and in the videos that we have it's amazing how these uh, months old babies that are being winged into hard food can actually uh, figure it out just like a baby that's trying to walk will fall down and you're not going to you know panic because they fell down you're just going to make sure they're in a safe space and help them get up and they'll try it again and then they'll figure it out and it's the same with chewing babies can really figure it out the muscles are made to eat consistent foods and and the design of the airway and so on changes dramatically when kids get to the speaking stage but early on it's very difficult physiologically for them to choke because you don't have the problem of, of mixed airway and food way that you have in older kids first couple of years I yes guess, I, I think uh, physiologically it's 18 months before the, the epiglottis, because when a baby is, is very young, they can swallow and breathe at the same time. You and I probably can't do that. Because well, it makes sense because they're like breastfeeding. Yeah. yeah so, and I think that change is, happens around 18 months. So before 18 months, it's practically, I'm not going to say impossible, it's very difficult for a baby to choke because, you know, the, the way the airway has developed before speech. Yeah, the you know that that transition around 18 months has made Heimlich famous. So, <laughs> uh, it, that's fascinating. Uh, I didn't know this about the 18 months. You know, uh, just to think that we have evolved to do that. That's funny. You know, it's the you know Jared Diamond basically he was the one who popularized the idea that uh, it was a huge switch in our evolution. Uh, to change the airway so that you could actually speak clearly. Uh, chimps can't. They can grunt, but they yeah, can't. Great leap forward. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it just think my head is like spinning, and I'm thinking about like you go to the pediatrician, and your kid is, you know, 
uh, you know, just born and they tell you, okay, you need to breastfeed. And if you can't breastfeed, here's your formula. And then they turn nine months and they're like, okay, let's start introducing some food. So you get the puree and then you get to the one year and then let's do some chicken nuggets. And then, and then you get to like, adults and they don't even know how to use a fork and a knife yeah like that drives me insane going to a restaurant and seeing like a like a full-grown adult like a grown-ass man that can't you know use a fork and a knife and that progression seems so crazy to me because you never trained for chewing and I can imagine that going from like not chewing not chewing not chewing and then the doctor saying okay the switch is flipped and now you need to start chewing uh, that could be very very dangerous and then and then a second thing that pops into my head is all those videos of newborns rooting and like looking for the nipple you know and and, uh, and like trying like helping themselves to start feeding and and that's you know it, that's not a uh, that's an innate behavior that babies have. And if you and my listeners, if you've never seen those videos, just go on YouTube and put breastfeeding baby, you know, rooting, and and they kind of like maneuver themselves to the areola and and they start sucking, and and it's very impressive. It, it occurs in lots of mammals, curiously enough. <laughs> yeah, it, all of them. <laughs> no, but think how liquid the diet is. I mean, think about. Uh, they're more likely to sit down in a restaurant and chew on a, basically drink a hamburger. I mean, the whole, the whole area is moving towards more and more processed and liquid food, and that's exactly the wrong direction. Are you guys scared of like the the um, the the juice fasting or the protein shakes or you know all of those liquid diets? We were we were just talking about that a few minutes ago. There, there are questions. I actually, this came to me in an article. My wife subscribes to about five of these health things, the Tufts Health, the Harvard Health, the Berkeley Health, and so on. And there was a big article in there about whether or not um, drinking uh, smoothies was a good way to get your fruit. Now, we've already selected the fruit to be almost liquid to begin with. I mean, you don't the only fruit you can really chew these days what is an apple. I mean, if you get a, the delicious pears or peaches, but the, you can drink them, essentially. But the whole discussion was on what happened, what happened to the nutrition. Was the nutrition uh, worse when you made a smoothie? It didn't mention the fact that you chew even less. And then there's other things that I'm worried about. And, and thank you for bringing this point because my, you know, a lot of the concerns that I have in my practice are people asking or having questions about weight loss. So my attention towards uh, liquid diets always turns to, well, you know, when you don't chew, you are bypassing satiety receptors. You know, I, you know, for my listeners right now, think about a hamburger or your favorite food, and you will start salivating. You don't even have, have to have it in front of you, and digestion begins. Imagine if you're bypassing chewing. Imagine if you can concentrate a ton of calories into a drink, and, and you're bypassing all those sensors, and that's not even taking into consideration the amount of exercise that you're doing when you chew. So, so it, it, you know... Maybe for a short term, if you really can't control your appetite and you need a, an easy way to, of reducing calorie intake as a meal replacement, maybe that's a good strategy. It's not going to work for a- everyone. But like this, this heroic efforts of going, you know, a, a month, you know, eat, drinking all your food. Sure, you're going to lose weight. But what happens to your face? Well, I don't know if a month is going to make a big difference, but. Chewing is bypassing a, a normal function, just like, you know, if we had wheelchairs, we'd go like, oh, nobody has to walk anymore, like in the Wally, right? <laughs> so we all should go on a wheelchair and let's stop walking. It's more efficient. We can get there faster. So the one thing that I always think about is we've got our par- parotid glands, and every time you chew, your masseters are squeezing it, and you are bringing the, the enzymes like tylen and, you know, that's Amylase where... And- yeah. First stage of digestion. Yeah, and so if you bypass that, then you're going to, you know, absorb nutrients com- in a completely different way because you're bypassing not only the, the physical part but also the chemical part. So 
if you do it for a short period, and I, I know you know friends of mine eat shakes of kale, and they say, well, yeah, I put you know uh, ten bundles of kale in here, and I could never chew that much. I said, well, maybe there's a reason why you can't chew that that much. <laughs> I've learned from um, from Robert Lustig and people that talk about sugar. He says when you use a, what we have in Mexico, piloncillo. I don't know how to say it in English, but those are sugars that you can't have a lot of. Your body actually has uh, locks, candados that keep you from being able to to uh, enjoy that much of that very heavy raw sugar. And if you get the processed stuff, you can have as much as you can. You can have ten cans of Coke with you know twelve spoons of sugar in each one and you wouldn't think twice about it it goes directly to your blood so if you have the full food then your body will tell you when you've had enough and you've got to have the variety you can't just have you know 10 bottles of, of, uh, of something that's good you can't have 10 bottles of cold <laughs> And, 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 and then you start getting into problems with like, you know, the oxalates and, and, you know, all these different things when you're eating super physiological, any of anything, super physiological levels of anything. So I'm going to confess, I grew up with five siblings and, uh, you know, if, if you didn't eat fast, you didn't eat. So I have, you know... It's it's more like uh, one of those shop bags. Instead of a mouth, I can just consume food so fast. How long should you take in order to chew your food and and eat? Because I I can seriously eat a full plate, and I'm not lying. Five minutes flat. So can I. And if, but it's a struggle. And the b basic answer is as slow as you can. In other words, you're unlikely to eat too slow. That's that's. Very few people have that problem. Uh, but there's a lot of data, as you know, if particularly if you're trying to reduce that eating more slowly. Well, I'm not really convinced there. I haven't seen any research, but it's not necessarily the time, but it's, you know, just chewing enough to get the nutrients and also chewing enough so that the food is actually liquid in your mouth and you get the the necessary you know muscle work to, to get it to 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 liquefy but you know I've, I've seen people that have beautiful jaws that eat very fast but they eat not a huge amount and so they you know they eat a, a, their food and then they make pauses with their teeth together and then they swallow without involving their facial muscles and that's something that i've been looking at how you chew and how you swallow so i'm not so much uh, so interested in the functional part, but I'm very interested in the postural because we have very um, strong forces when we do function, and then we have very light sustained forces, which is the posture. And really for developing your jaws, I'm finding more and more that the posture is more important. So you need to do the, the heavy chewing to have the strength so that you have the tone in your muscles to hold your posture for long periods. So the posture is really what's gonna make your jaw grow or not. And if you're doing a lot of exercise with your muscles, you will have the, the strength to maintain that posture when you sleep, which is really when we grow. So our jaws grow at night and you're not eating at night, but when you're swallowing and your muscles have that light tonicity, the same thing happens in your body. If you have a good tone and you're holding your body, then you're gonna, you know, develop better and feel better. Same thing with your jaw muscles. Well, you know, you've seen the old diagram of when the growth hormone is produced it's while you're sleeping. And if your sleep is being disturbed, what can I tell you? Yeah, you know a lot about the stress. But really, you know, we're focusing in one thing, you know, you gotta chew, you gotta slow down. You're, yes, you gotta slow down. If you're engulfing your food and you don't have the strength, you have to come up with ways to develop the strength and to chew gum and to figure out how to get normal. But I've seen normal, and this is something that I'm trying to, to do is find, I've, I have a couple cases of people that have wisdom teeth and have beautiful straight teeth and that have never had braces. And I'm trying to find out what things they are doing because if we don't know what the, you know, the seven habits always tell you, start with the end in mind. And we don't really know what these people are doing because there's very few of them that have this beautiful jaws with perfect teeth. So we got to find them and find out what they're doing. And then we'll know if eating fast is good. If it's, all, the, all that we're doing right now is just proposing theories. 
but I do. I'm not convinced that you know by chewing slowly, is is you're gonna develop better. It's more about what you do between the times when you're chewing, when you're not doing anything. How are you resting? Yeah, and that, you're completely right. You know because I, we talk in the in in the health sphere about uh, how your abs are are carved with a fork, meaning that you can you cannot work out and have abs. As long as you're sleeping well, as long as your your stress is well, uh, as long as you're having some sort of like good activity, meaning maybe walking around, getting some good sun, and when everything lines up, then you are going to develop better. Uh, there's people that are exercising five hours a day and don't have abs, and there's people that are not exercising or ex exercising to a minimal extent and they have abs. So what are they doing? So yeah, you are completely correct about that. It's a huge in medicine and public health in general is that there is genetic and environmental variation from person to person and it's very difficult as Sandra was saying about the various treatments and so on uh, you got you have to pay attention to the entire individual and there are very of all the health rules that I think actually applies almost universally it's use it or lose it in other words if you don't exercise in various ways between chewing, walking, trying to sit up straight, that sort of thing. Uh, that's what keep, that's one thing that will keep you healthy. What the other little details, it varies from person to person. What about, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, wisdom teeth, uh, even if it's theoretical or, or even if it's hy uh, a hypothesis, do you think that we should be taking them out? I mean, that, that's a that's a difficult question. It, it, we definitely should not. But when you don't have room, then they don't have room. So you can get an infection. I'm not going to say never take your wisdom teeth out, no matter what. But we're taking them taking them out way too much. And there's research that yeah, shows there's a government publication that basically says it's it's a uh, uh, a doctor caused disease uh, through removing too much removal of wisdom teeth. Of course, if we say that in public. We're going to be sued by Lamborghini. We're going to be sued by Mercedes and so on because it's oral surgeons that support those companies. And, you know, they'll go broke if they don't can't take out wisdom teeth and make people miserable. No, what I can tell you is a fact. If you get your four-year-old child to me or to Dr. Mew or to an orthotropist or forwardonist, they are going to have room for their wisdom teeth if they follow our instructions. Absolutely. There will be no reason why this kid, no matter what their genetic component is, that will have a problem with uh, fitting those teeth. Any evolutionary reasons why we get uh, uh, root canals or uh, why we get infections? Have you, have you uh, looked at that? Not, not personally, but I would say <laughs> that certainly agriculture put, must play a role there because we have changed the composition of the, the bacterial uh, community in our mouths to be more conducive to uh, the ones that give you problems. Yeah, so so you know that's that's another thing that you know uh, within the holistic environment, you know, with with uh, within uh, you know the more natural health, there's a couple of ideas about removing the tooth and not doing a uh, ear root canal, uh, and that's kind of like you know should we be. Uh, Fixing them, or should we just remove the teeth? You know, it, and and it it's complicated, and I don't know if there's a, there's an easy answer to that. No, I, well, I personally don't know. Sandra, do you have any real idea? Uh, well, evolutionarily, no. We definitely have a predisposition for certain bacteria to live in our in our mouth, but it has to do with acidity. We've changed the acidity with our diet. So the the lower your pH, the more bacteria is, is going to thrive. I mean, we have all the bacteria, but when they get out of balance and um, the whole bacteria, the microorganism uh, part of, um, of healthcare is right now look, being looked at by everyone because we know the microorganisms are really what keeps us healthy and we need to have all of them in balance. And when we have a, 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 an acid environment for the bacteria, then some of them start getting, you know, imbalance out of control and research. that's when you that's when you can have decay but you know you need to have certain conditions to have decay and we definitely have the the predisposition genetically 
but we we didn't have cavities. You, you mentioned Western Price, and he looked at you know uh, communities that didn't have processed food, and they have no decay, no yeah. gum disease, they're, no they're decay, wear. no crowding. Yeah, you, what you see is more wear in those skulls, uh, but not more decay. Essentially, no decay. Essentially, no uh, malocclusion. That is, no <laughs> crooked teeth. Because there's no reason yeah. for the teeth to be crooked with the jaws big enough. And then another theory that we're working on uh, with Dr. Wong right now in, in Australia is something that, you know, we all know that, that the production of saliva. Saliva is prote protects, protects you against cavities. And if you have an open mouth, your mouth dries up. So you don't have saliva. And also, if you're in, in, the, in the sympathetic drive, our, our brain has two, two modes, and you're in the sympathetic, you're fight and flight then your mouth rises up, right? So if you stay longer in the parasympathetic where you're in rest and repair mode, you will produce more saliva. So cavities are completely, there's, you know, this is not even questionable. We know there's enough research that the, if you have a good flow of saliva, you will not have decay because it has a prophylactic um, function in your mouth. So the, the saliva production is another area that you know, if your mouth is open, you're going to have more cavities. And I've had people that have gone to their dentist with spontaneous cure of their gum disease, where they were scheduled to have surgery, and they started with exercises, and you take go, and my friend had uh, put tape on his mouth, and then he went back to his uh, periodontist and said, oh, so you had the surgery already. He says, no, I didn't. He says, you must have had, because your pockets have reduced all the way. He says, no, I just started sleeping with my mouth closed. I mean, that's not for everyone, but it, there's definitely a um, um, decay is absolutely a, a disease of industrialization. Absolutely. That's not even you know, controversial. Wow. And, and that, so I, I do take care of some patients with POTS syndrome, and they suffer from uh, low, low saliva production from autoimmune, uh, autoimmune attack to their parotid glands. Any 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 rinses or anything that you recommend or or any exercises or anything that you would uh, feel comfortable sharing about you know how to increase production of saliva? Are you familiar with the Tropic premise? Mm -mm. I'm sure you, might, you might not. Yeah, it's in the book, but you might not be familiar by name. But you know because you told me you just put your tongue to the roof of your mouth. So if I, I work in hospitals, I've worked for for in my resume you saw in my CV that I've done craniofacial and. Uh, kids with cleft lip and palate, and, and kids that have all kinds of, um, of syndromes. And I would say 100% of them are mouth breathers. Very rarely seen syndromic kids that nose breathe. So if you can do anything to get these kids to close their mouth, keep the teeth in contact, and keep the tongue in the roof of the mouth consistently, and not functionally, not like, let me see you swallow with the tongue in the mouth of them, no. If when they're watching TV, when they're playing an instrument, when they're concentrating on something else, if they have their mouth closed and the teeth together and the tongue in the roof of the mouth, they will definitely produce more saliva and be healthier. It's hard for me to have an opinion if you have an autoimmune disease that's also um, increasing. And, and if your priority glands are, are being auto-attacked, then, you know, I don't know, but your other glands might might take over as so your sublingual um, uh, Glands might produce some extra saliva to, to, to help them. So there, there's a lot of things that will improve just by closing the mouth. Yeah, and, and it's not POTS, it's Sorgen's syndrome that attacks the parotids, yeah. Yeah, but the, the, for Sorgen's, there's a lot of uh, drugs for serostomia and the, 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 they can be on. Yeah, but, but it's interesting that you say that because I know about mouth breathing and you just gave me, you know, like I, I you know, I, I am a naturopath and I practice holistically and I have patients that have serostomia and I, I am quick to do like rinses or different things, but I've never had an honest discussion about jaw posture. And I promise, promise you that that from now on I will, because it is so important. Uh, and, and, you know, I know this information, but you get so into your head and, and I have so many different tools that I can use and I will start using that extra tool because if you close your mouth, that saliva is not going to evaporate. I mean, I can give you so many tools that will blow in your mind. One of them that I found out was the, the, the ear infections, all the kids with the ear tube. 
if they learn how to swallow properly and keep the mouth closed, there's no ear infections because the actually the, the swallowing of the posterior part of the tongue uh, pushing actually opens up and, and creates the vacuum so that they, they're drained. So they don't need to have those tooth placed. I mean, so many kids are having sur surgeries in the hospitals where, I, where I'm working. That's one. And another one that um, I'm still waiting to, to learn more about this and talk more about the, the people um, that are doing stress, but the vagus nerve passes behind the, the where the, the tongue is pushing. So if you teach it, uh, somebody to hold their, their tongue with pressure, at the very back of the palate, you will stimulate the vagus nerve, and that will put the the patient into rest and repair. It will uh, trigger the the parasympathetic system. So if you're able to sleep at night with some pressure in the uh, in that area, then you will rest and repair so much better. So there's all these things that have to do with your tongue and your mouth and, and your face that will impact your, your overall health. And holistic doctors have a, uh, a huge um, uh, world in front of them because they can really start helping patients with things that do work because they see the full patient. And, you know, I recommend exercises and, and I recommend, you know, walking and, and meditation. And I have the luxury to have an audience that when they come to me, they are not satisfied with here's your script uh, I'll see you in three months they want these different uh, uh, strategies and they they want these different uh, exercises in order to be healthier and and yeah I need to start incorporating that into my practice thank you so much you know where can people find you how can people get the book uh, how can we get this message out to everyone go to Amazon uh, advanced search books, and then look for Khan, K-A-H-N, as the author, and Jaws in the uh, in the title, and you can get it as a hardback or as an ebook, an electronic uh, book, and it is only twenty-five bucks, and we don't get a nickel of that. Whatever we uh, goes to, uh, the, we're trying to solve this problem, just like you're trying to solve the problem. So we have no. Uh, conscience about flogging the book as hard as possible. The more copies you buy, the more we're going to do things to help humanity because we're we neither of us uh, is poor. No, it, that, and that's excellent. Yeah, so I'll I'll put your uh, I'll put a link on the on the description to the show so people don't have to do all the hard work and they can just click on it and and buy a copy for you and a copy for anyone that has a four year old or anyone that wants to have a baby. Or has a mouth. Yeah, yeah or, or anyone that has a mouth. That's that's it. But if you have a mouth, buy this book. <laughs> Do you guys have like a Facebook page or a Twitter or, you know, uh, uh, any social media handles? Uh, I, I do have a website. It's Forward on Ticks. I will I will send you an email. The signature to my email has all that stuff in it. Both of you want to get involved with the mob which I, you can see in the signature, uh, you might find it a good place for you to do some blogging and some helping and trying to get civil society to solve these problems, the big ones. Totally. I will include all of these links in, in, my, in the show notes because this is like super exciting information. Uh, you know, th this is a message that sometimes, you know, I, I love talking about the mismatches and how it's not a maladaptation. I know, you know, in anything that happens like that or any any time I, I encounter a subject like that, especially that is like so it's not like out there is it's like so in front of us, like the nose in front of your face that you don't see. And anytime that someone brings it up to me, I get super excited and, it, and it's just such a great topic and just bring it to the forefront and informing people that it's not your fault, A, and B, you, we can fix it. And, and that is just empowering. Paul and Sandra, thank you so much for being on the show. You know, maybe in the in six months or three months, maybe we can do a Facebook Live and maybe we can take uh, questions directly from uh, my audience and we can help uh, uh, spread this message and inform more people about your work. Be delighted to do it. Thank you very much for the exposure. It's, it's been a joy talking to you.
Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.